things work easier. And when you don't have it, there's a tax. And that tax costs time and money. Okay, incredibly simple. I've just summarized the book, but what do I do with that, right? right. Stephen M. R. Covey has productized that in a wonderful degree in terms of training and other opportunities so that you take those basic ideas and you scale them out so that people apply the idea. I think there's a myth that a lot of people, when they re they produce a book, they say, oh, people will read it, understand it, and it'll change their lives. That doesn't happen by magic. No, exactly. No, and, and great example, Bill, uh, real quick, uh, Peter, you know, one of the things that the Covey organization did really well, too, is they, they, they really tracked and protected their trademarks really, really well, but they didn't do it from a litigious perspective. If somebody was referencing their material more than they should, they reached out first to see, hey, thanks, let's collaborate. And then if it didn't go exactly. from there, they would aggressively protect themselves. But uh, they created a significant amount of collaboration from what would have been, quote unquote, perceived as competitors. And they did it really well. But each time adding additional value to the audience, and it was just growing their, you know, their opportunities on a daily basis. Excellent. Robert, you had a question, and there's a couple of questions in the chat I'll get to in a, in a moment here. Yeah, I want to go back to something David said a few minutes ago. He was talking about the guy who put a short video on his website for each chapter. I had been thinking of something different, and that was using my blog as a way to introduce parts of the book or each chapter in the book. Do you sure. think using the blog can be as effective as the video? It certainly can be, uh, from my opinion. Blogs don't sound as sexy and current as some of the other platforms, but anything you can do to get them out of the book, to take the information a little bit deeper, give them some, a little additional resource, uh, most importantly, to get to know you, it can be very valuable. Video okay. has just got a great way of getting people to fall in love with you quicker, but I think it's a good start. Yep. Start with that. All right, I didn't that. know we'd be talking about sex. But what are some of the other sexy ways besides the blog? <laughs> uh, well, certainly um, the video is probably one of the, the biggest ways to do it because you really can get a right. personal connection with them. Um, I would just say don't call it a blog. You can tell it, take them to your website for a particular article yeah. that is in your blog. Uh, okay. And let them continue to, to dig deeper, give them that opportunity. But, uh, you know, blogging seems, it's not, but blogging seems in the consumer's eyes yesterday. Uh, when it's still very relevant, it's still very indexable, but still a great way for you to actively communicate yep. with your fans and followers through your website, just avoid the word blog. That's my great. narrow. So, so Howard, thank you, David. So, so Howard had a question, and then uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll answer it and then ask you to answer it too, David, and see if we can vehemently you know, argue about something. Howard's question was around, you know, do you have a, a, a website for each of your books, or do you just throw a tag on your page? My opinion on that is usually you do sort of a you know book.com you know blah 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 title or the book or whatever.com for some period of time during launch 60 days 90 days 180 days whatever it is and then ultimately fold that into a tab on on your website that's that's what i've seen that tends to work but i don't know if you would uh, concur with that or not david there's probably not a wrong answer, uh, Peter, but you and I probably don't disagree on many things, but I would say in today's world, it's so hard to get traffic to your website. Um, so I, I, my, my vote is to have a, a website about you. You know, it could be, you know, davidhancock.com or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. you could have a, a tab for each one of your books. Um, but very specifically, you should own those domains and they can be redirected to the tabs on your website. Yeah. Uh, and there, you know, it could just be something as simply as, you know, rayedwards.com forward slash permission to prosper. And that page can look like a standalone site, but anything you can do to drive traffic to one single site just makes you more discoverable in future search engine optimization. Um, so that, that's been my vote for a while. And then David had another, I'm sorry, Howard had another question on uh, the, the use of assessments, uh, you know, using an assessment as sort of a hook for the book. And, and my take on that is, there are assessments and there are assessments, right? So to me, the work that Bill tend to, and I tend to do tends to be focused on the enterprise level, the Fortune 500, the Fortune 1000 sophisticated. So anytime we're behind an assessment, it's going to be validated. It's got to be scientifically based. And we've all seen these other ones that are sort of like, the, you know, the makeup counter Bloomingdale's, you're a spring, a summer, a winter. 
Um, I think if your audience is unsophisticated, you might be able to get get away with that. It wouldn't be my recommendation because there are uh, people love assessments because what else, what better than to tell me more about me, my favorite topic, and then they love being able That's to share right. them, group them up in teams, etc. But I think I would caution against you know, uh, a, a non-scientific or, a, you know, oh, I can just write up eight questions, blah, 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 sort of thing. I think, I think people have gotten a little smarter than, you know, the Facebook quiz level of assessment. You want, you right. want to come across as smarter than that. Um, let me just go right. through the chat. We had a couple other questions pop in here. So yeah, Leslie quick, asked, and I don't know the answer to this. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. I'll just say real quick on that idea, Peter. And if you do an assessment, you know, follow Peter's guidance, but do whatever you can to make it so it's hands off. Try to automate it. Try to use technology. It totally. Um, that way, totally. You don't you don't have to field three hundred assessments personally every month from your book sales. Uh, that'll just drive you crazy and um, won't be fun. And we want you to have fun and have time to do other things. So automate it as best you can. And again, let book sales let opportunity pay for it. So you don't have to have it all up and running on day one, book one. But those are the goals you need to work towards, or those are some of the things that you may want to consider investing in to make it easier but they can be very, yep. very effective. Yep. So Leslie had a question that I have no idea how to answer, so I'll give it to you, Dave, because why not? Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> so how does this, so Leslie's uh, question was an example of how to use this for fiction. So you know, fiction is still about uh, moving the masses down a storyline. Um, so fiction and nonfiction certainly could be um, considered uh, different ways to market. On fiction, what we're teaching our authors and seeing from some of our most successful fiction authors is creating side storylines, creating additional information, getting to know you as an author. Because once they start to love your books, they're going to start loving you and really want you to create more content. Yeah. So give them reasons to want more. Help them decide what next to write. So if you've got some really awesome characters in your books or really great messages in your books or even a, a morale or something that's in the book that you can have some side conversations online, yeah. that can be very, very specific. But let's and say you've got a character that? that you just really love writing and you want to expand on, but there's not enough room in the book or your publisher says, hey, only 60,000 words. You know, drive them to the web and carry that conversation on. And who knows, you could be writing your next book you know, out of your blog post. Um, but that's that's one thing. So still create conversations, get them to leave the website for additional information. Um, it's one of a couple different things from a fiction perspective, but it's all about creating the conversation and getting them to fall in love with you and your content. Tie it into local events. So if something's going on in the world today, hey, let's say your book has a COVID type thing in it. Well, you know, create opportunities to talk about that and respond to news media. So, hey, that's just like what happens in my book and, you know, or something like that. We can go deeper into that on the fiction side because it's, it's very similar, but different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then Romina had a question about sort of um, if you're naming that section of, of, of your website blog, is there a better tag to, to use for that if blog is a bit of an antiquated term? Uh, this is where your guerrilla creativity can come in line. It could just be additional resources. Uh, it could be the blog. It, you can, it certainly doesn't hurt to be called the blog. I just wouldn't put it in your book. Um, it could be articles. Um, yep. I, I'm a fan of additional resources. Yeah, that works. Okay, and then Howard's got, this is a good one. So uh, additional differences between traditional hybrid and, and, and self-publishing. So I think, let me sort of chunk it into an area that we haven't, uh, talk about is there's a business model piece to this, right? So in some instances, if you're lucky enough to potentially get a traditional sort of big house publishing deal with an advance, I think people look at that and don't do the calculus on it. So what is an advance? An advance is an advance against projected earnings. So it's not free money. It's not money that fell from the sky. It's not whatever. So they're going to give you some subset of what they think the book will earn up front. And until you earn that out, you're not getting any more money. So, the, you know, I've seen what I call sort of the, the worst of time models with some <laughs> traditional publishers now saying, OK, we're not going to give you an advance because very few are doing that now. And in fact, we're going to ask that you buy, you, you do a guaranteed buy as the author, uh, you know, whatever, 2,000 copies, 3,000 copies, 4,000 copies over some period of time at wholesale, which is 50 percent of retail. So in essence, what they're saying is, you're going to underwrite the risk that we're taking. You're going to spend 40, 50 K to, to offset the first cost that we have for editorial and printing. If that works out well, uh, and the book sells tremendously, congrats, you get 10 or 15% of that. Um, if not, you lost 40 or 50 grand. That doesn't sound like a good partner to me. Like I wouldn't want to do business with a partner that came to me with those terms, but you know, 
that's what we're seeing. We, we, what would you add to that, David? How would you take that? Yeah, I agree. You definitely have to be careful. And unfortunately, according to Publishers Weekly, 98% of advances aren't earned out. And if you're, that means that 98% of the books don't ever earn a single royalty beyond their advance. So if you're trying to get that advanced model, we'll try to get as much as you can <laughs> because, you know, that could be you know, all you earn. But then you got to watch out if you're first, maybe second, even sometimes third time author or more. If you haven't had a breakout book yet, you can pretty much guarantee that hidden in your 35 page, you know, uh, publishing agreement that there is a clause unless somebody's smart enough to find it and get it negotiated out that says if you don't earn the advance, you pay it back. So you got to be very, very, very careful. So we pay small advances, mostly for political reasons, um, because we want our authors to be able to say, they have got one, yes, but we also want to make sure that Publishers Weekly treats us like a traditional house where, where it matters and the airport books carry, airport bookstores carry our books because they look for that traditional aspect of advances. But you do need to, to be very careful. Um, and again, understanding that the world is constantly changing. And even today, the average advance for a nonfiction book in America is now $500. That's taking into consideration the five million dollars they just paid Jane Doe or whoever that was. Um, so it's don't focus on the advance, focus on the opportunity. <laughs> Great. So let's pause for a minute. Anybody got any questions? They want to raise their hand or wave or just ask Dave or I or anybody. Okay, Robert, you're waving your hand again. There we go. Yeah, uh, Dave, what do you think of an ebook to accompany your? Hardcover or soft cover book? Do we need an e version? Absolutely, yes. In fact, uh, my tr my my training to our authors is that we need to make the book available in any format that somebody could possibly want it. It's a okay. true gorilla gorilla characteristic. So much so that we, as a publisher, we distribute our eBooks to over eighteen hundred different platforms. Heck, we even sell the books on the blockchain. I have no idea what that means. I'm gonna have I know that much what it means. So, but my thinking is, if they want it in hardcover, give it to them in hardcover. If they want it in paperback, give it to them in paperback. If they want it in e, give it to them in e. If they want it uh, in audio, give it to them in audio. Any way that they could possibly want it, uh, I think we need to provide. Uh, we have a we have an obligation to give them what they want because it gives us what we want. Thank you. Got it. Funny thing. Ramini is asking. Uh, uh, so Ramini is asking about Facebook ads over Google ads for. Um, Book marketing. I'll, I'll give an answer, and then Dave, you could you could chime in as well. I, I would think um, it depends on who your market is and what your objectives are. I've yet to really see a Facebook or a Google ad campaign that makes sense just mathematically on book sale, right? So, going to pay this cost per click for customer acquisition to sell a book for twenty bucks to make eight dollars or whatever the math is. Now, if it's a client acquisition vehicle, that's a different story. So, I think it really depends on what your goals and what your objectives are. It wouldn't make sense to spend. $20 to make two, you know, on a book, but it would make sense to spend $20 to acquire a client that could spend tens of thousands. So I don't know what you would add to that, David. Yeah, I agree. As, as authors, we make so little money from our royalties. Even those, those publishers that like us that pay, you know, the higher 20 to 30%, you really can't do an effective, you know, ad campaign on Facebook or Google and make enough money to pay for it. So you've got to monetize the book. So don't waste your time or money. If you do want to tackle it, again, make sure there's a way to monetize it in your process, like the acquisitions of additional clients or capturing the names and doing things like that. Uh, but definitely don't try to, to figure it out yourself. You'll spend so much money with very little results very, very quick. You'll get discouraged. Well, one, we don't want that. But also, two, we don't want you to waste your money. So either get the training to learn how to do it yourself. And there's some great resources out there. Or end up hiring somebody to do it for you. But again, remember, it's the least profitable way to sell books. It's the best way to sell, you know, client acquisition if you can. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Uh, we got a question on building an audience. If you're a new audience, I guess it means if you're, sort of you're a new author. You know, I, I I don't think there's one best practice here to build an audience. I I, I would start with the like-minded and building community. So if you're writing a book about X, who else is known in that space? Who else are people following that space? How do you start connecting to those people? How do you start commenting with those people? Um, you know, building an audience is hard. It takes it takes years and years and years and years. I think it's really more about being deliberate and it's and it's quality over quantity, right? You you, you know, get getting lists that you could buy of uh, God knows what they are on Twitter is useless, but getting real connection and 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 such, I think, is is, is uh, a little bit more more valuable there. 
Yeah, and exercise your gorilla patience because it does take time. It is worth the wait and it is worth the process, but it does take time. Um, so just content. It's all about content and you being that authority and serving your audience, giving them above and beyond what they expect, but being consistent. I've always said that probably of all of the things you could do, consistency and patience are going to be the two things that lead you to the edge. Yeah, the good edge. Mm-hmm. Yep. Then we got a question from Leslie on uh, how important are reviews and which ones. So actually, David, you answer this one first, and then maybe I'll agree or disagree with it. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I think reviews are very important. I should I should say you should always ask and never stop asking for endorsement and reviews. They can be very significant. Um, drive as many reviews on Amazon as you can uh, because a couple things. For instance, now you don't get, you won't hear me saying drive as much to Amazon as possible because. Uh, you'll end up ticking off all the other bookstore buyers. But the reality is uh, a lot of the buyers, no matter where they buy the book from, will often go to Amazon to read the review. So definitely focus on trying to get as many reviews on Amazon as you possibly can and start with the ebook. If you can get the ebook released early, start driving reviews because that can help actually influence you know the conversation so the pre-orders come in so the print distribution goes better. But never stop trying to get endorsements. You can always add them to the book later, second editions or mid second printings, do things like that, and definitely add them to your website. But we all look to, at our at our um, our social influences, the peers that uh, that we respect, the people that we respect, the influences that we respect, uh, as many as people as those can, can be effective. But don't think they all need to be celebrities. I think a good mix is probably, you know, 95% uh, John and Jane Doe with a good mix of, you know, 5%, uh, you know, big name. They all matter. And I, th- I think it's it's also important around la- launch if you're fairly unknown, which which 99.9% of us are, that when folks go to Amazon to either buy or check it out, you have at least six or eight or ten positive reviews there. So you have to do sort of that that immediate launch book review campaign, you know, where you're asking your friends, your colleagues, and such to say, hey, do me a favor, just do you pop a review in there, uh, kind of thing. Le- Leslie asked also about book awards. So what are, what are your thoughts on? The importance of book awards. Everybody likes trophies and awards, but what, what that impact? We all, we all love yeah, we all love the trophies and awards, and they're, they're good reasons to brag about yourself. We as authors have so few opportunities that we can flip that table and be ninety-five percent about us and our goal, and five percent about the platform and why they're following you. So, book awards, nominations, you know, going through the whole process can be very significant. Um, I would say just caution on some book awards are just their businesses. Uh, most of them are some sort of business, so. Just be careful. Don't yeah. that spending thousands of dollars on submission fees. Be very specific about books that are similar to yours that you can really leverage. But also make sure you're submitting to awards that are relevant for your, your book. There are self-publishing awards. There are books that are only specifically for traditionally published mm-hmm. you know, authors. So you wouldn't want to submit your HarperCollins book to a self-publishing you know, place, and you wouldn't want to submit your self-publishing book to, to a traditional you know, thing because you just get discouraged or waste your money. So be very focused. Or you don't want to be associated with you know, the, the quality that typically comes from the self-publishing side. So you don't want to be, you know, the, the runner up to a book that's worse than yours. <laughs> if, if, if you know what I mean? So just be very specific. Um, uh, but also, again, as Peter said, which was brilliant, you know, your, your heroes, the people that you, you know, emulate to, you know, the authors that you respect, the authors that you read, submit to the same, you know, awards that they're getting, you know, their nominations for and they're winning for, as long as you're published similarly uh, or in a similar vein, uh, you don't have to recreate it. But again, don't waste time or money. That's very important. Yep, yep. I also, let's talk for a minute, David, about the difference between what I would call sort of hand-to-hand combat and air cover. So a lot of people, when they get into book mode, they do what smart people, or they believe to be smart people, tell them to do. Hire a PR firm, do a book marketing campaign, You know, do this, do that. It's like, okay, phew. There goes a lot of money, and and you know because I've never done this before, um, I don't know. It seems like a good idea. That PR firm seemed good. That book marketing firm seemed good, and they 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 don't do as much hand to hand. So tell me sort of the what to look out for. And I'm not saying from a scam perspective, but how to calibrate expectations and be thoughtful yet yet you know cautious when yeah. when investing in your marketing dollars because that's where I think a lot of most people get really really burnt and frustrated. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I've got some great friends that are in the industry that I love and respect, and they do a phenomenal job at what they do. They get amazing coverage, but you really have to watch that and that um, you know the results side of it, and really what your expectations are. Um, yeah, again, one of the things that I learned from a dear friend of mine who founded and ran one of the nation's largest book publicity firm, 
And actually, after he retired, he came on board with us for about 10 years before he retired for a second time. He taught me, he said, you know, uh, publicists and PR firms have an amazing guarantee. They guarantee to bill you every month. <laughs> but the, but the reality is it, they use it in advance. But the reality is they're, they're, they can be good. Um, so definitely you know, track down their references and interview them and talk to them because uh, they can be very good. They're very good at what they do. It just doesn't necessarily mean that just because you show up on all the media channels or get interviewed by 20 radio stations that you're going to sell enough books to pay for it. So keep that in mind. It could be about future opportunity. It could be about you know, further positioning you from a national scale as an authority, which could their later benefit from a speaking perspective yep. or the products and services. What I, I would say... You, it's also being realistic. I've had clients come to me and say, oh, I found this great PR firm and they did, you know, Ken Blanchard's or, you know, Tom Peters book. And I have to look at them and say, that's great. They did Ken Blanchard's seventh book. You're not Ken Blanchard with all due respect. Right. right? So the expectations right. that, you know, uh, you know, if, if you have a pre-existing condition of being a New York Times bestseller, it tends to be chronic. Right? If you haven't been there yet, right. it's hard to start. And I think just because they've been yeah. able to do wonders with rock stars or, or people that you admire and respect and such, doesn't mean that you're going to expect uh, uh, the same outcome. I would, and I would have that expectation uh, or, or that conversation around what could I realistically expect here? And I think the other thing I see is people, um, smart people get really confused with terminology, particularly in the social media space that they just don't understand. Oh, we're going to get engagement. We're going to get retweets. We're going to get follow. Okay, great. Break that down for me. What is that? Because it sounds like I'm learning a new language because I don't understand it, but what do those things mean? What are they predictive indicators of? Do I care about them? Am I willing to invest in them? Because it just, you know, if you're doing this because you're afraid to go time out, explain that to me, yeah. um, that's, that's going to, that's going to escalate. So what, what would you yeah. counsel there, David? Oh, absolutely. One of my favorite um, guys does it very well. Dennis Welch. He, he's a, a Texas uh, publicist, phenomenally connected to the industry, does a phenomenal job with his clients. But, you know, having a talk with somebody like Dennis to talk about, well, what is the expectation? What is your goal? What is the budget? How are you planning on paying for it? You know, those conversations are very real. And what does it mean? Just because I'm getting retweets and those things are successes in the, in the traditional world or in the publishing or publicist world. How does that drill down to, you know, how am I going to benefit from that? And one of the things that I know Dennis does really well is just have that good, clean conversation with the author up front saying, hey, what are the goals? And, and help me figure out, is this the right path? Or, hey, let's build the platform so you're investing in the platform, not expecting to recoup that money in book sales because it's, it's all a process. Uh, but it's, um, it's something you definitely need to have some guidance. Don't just jump into it alone. I always recommend to, yep. to interview at least, at least more than one. Um, to catch that right vision for the book. Because, you know, it's, it's a business. You know, typically in business, somebody's there to sell you as much as you can before you start runaway screaming. But there, there are a few relationships out there, you know, like Media Connect, like Dennis, like some others that really yep. value your success because ultimately they want to stay in business for 50 years versus, you know, the next 15 months. <laughs> and, it's a, and it also depends on what you're, you're selling after the book and what the value is. So I had a call earlier this week with a gentleman that uh, runs a mastery group, and it's for pretty successful entrepreneurs. And the cost of entry is $250,000. So uh, a ten or fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 customer acquisition cost to him is like, okay, not a big deal. You know, it's, it's seven, eight percent of the life of the value of the customer. For some of us, if we're selling a $5,000 coaching service and we're spending $20,000 to get it, you're not going to make that up in volume. So again, a lot of this comes down to business and, 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 and math. Uh, 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 you know, that you, that you, you know and, and it either works or it doesn't. The numbers don't lie. And there's a little bit of ego in there too. And, and I'm okay with that as long as you keep a check, but uh, it's the process. But you're <laughs> right. You've got to pay attention to the numbers. <laughs> so somebody just asked me to go through here. Uh, but Robert asked, what services does thought leadership provide? So uh, well, I don't want to do an infomercial, but you can check out our site. We are uh, a consulting firm that works with authors, thought leaders, speakers, consultants, and helping them develop their strategy, their brands, their platforms, et cetera. So I, I won't uh, take up everybody's time on an infomercial, but check out our site and uh, happy to chat with you. Robert, with your, your hand up there. Yeah, um, this is for David and for Peter. What was the age of the oldest author you ever worked with to make he or she successful, quote unquote? Oh my gosh. That's a good question. Wow. Yeah, um, so I guess it depends on what, 
at, at that point, sometimes the author may have already been successful at that age, but not always. So I think the oldest author we worked with was in the 80s. And I think we had three in the upper 80s. Uh, um, uh, CEO of Volvo, um, Herr Gulenheimer's books coming out next month. He's, I think he's well into his 80s. And this is basically his third book. And I think he'll do really, really well with it. But Jay Levinson was in his 80s. We learned more from him than he ever learned from us, of course. Uh, and uh, gracious, there was one other financier from the UK that we did his first book when he was uh, definitely in his late 80s. And uh, he's still continually getting speaking gigs because of that book. So uh, age is uh, is just a number when it comes to being the authority in the space. Yeah. Uh, it's all I, the energy. Yeah. Yeah, I would answer that a little bit differently. Is We've had several, I don't know if we've had in for 80s, but several in, in a different phase in their career, in their 60s and 70s, where they've been incredibly successful CEO, entrepreneur, whatever. Right. But they're brand new in this space and transitioning. So we've done a lot in that space. I don't, you know, I don't think age, I'd rather work with a, with a well-seasoned, you know, six life coach to try to change the world. My personal take. I agree. It's freezing. I don't know if others are hearing it, hearing it too, or not hearing it. Well, I got. I have a question. Okay. Yeah, you, ahead, me at all. Do you see me? I, I I hear you. Is that Gary? I, I think yeah. Peter's frozen up right now. But Gary, go ahead. Yes, uh, Gary Waters speaking. Here's a quick a quick question. What's a reasonable starting point for uh, to get someone to market your book? Okay. Yeah. Now, I first let me give you this. The book is is one, but also what I'm trying to do in regards to do a works do workshops. Yeah, so I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I, I do know that the workshops can be very significant, especially with somebody at your level, Gary, to get them out of the book and start getting engaged with you. You're blessed with the opportunity that people want to get to know who you are just because of who you are, but the value you can continue to bring to the table, I think, is the workshops. And they'll do what you want them to do because they respect you on so many different levels that the book is just icing on the cake. But workshops can be very, very effective. When Jay Levison quasi retired in his latter years, he was doing literally just about gracious one a month. So 12 a year, he would bring 12 people to his house for $1,500 to $2,500 a piece just to spend a, a couple mm -hmm. nights with them. And oh, uh, he, was, he was killing it. He was leaving a phenomenal legacy for his bride when he did pass away. But and it was so easy for him. So those things can be very, very powerful. Well, that's great, great information. But the other part of that question is, Dave, yeah. that um, what is the, what is it a reasonable um, cost to hire okay. someone to market? Yeah, so that's a, that's a I mean, great a starting question. point now. I, you know, I'm at the starting point, so I want to make sure I'm just not giving away money now. No, yeah, we definitely don't want to give away money unless you get something great in return, unless you're just super, super generous. Uh, but there, there are campaigns that will blow your mind to campaigns that are very affordable. Uh, part of it certainly is, is the goal, uh, but you could start out with a publicist to help you out with a couple months before your pub date to a couple months after your pub date. And you'll probably be anywhere from three to $4,000 a month you know, to, to make that happen. Again, my prayer for you and anybody is, is how do we monetize that? How do we, how do we pay for that? Um, I think we all need to be addicted to opium, other people's money, opium, other people's money, we all possible. So free, free sell as many books as you can, uh, pay for it in any way that you can. But um, and then there's a the level. So, for instance, if you just want to start the media path, uh, you could work with somebody that really does a really good job at the radio tours. Start start with something as simple as a radio tour. So you can commit to one thing, you know, that will guarantee that will get you on 20 radio stations for three grand. And that could be a, a good start because sometimes publicity besets publicity. And the more that you get out there, the easier it is to get more. Um, and then you can spend campaigns that I've actually been a part of that literally spend a million dollars a month to do as much public publicity as they can. So, you know, Gary, it's a tough question. Um, I would say talk to a, a handful of people to, to, to get started, but I would say probably yeah. if you set aside five grand to start with, you'll probably be safe to at least start something good. And hopefully... Okay. Um, do some things that monetize to go further. 
Well, I, I would add to that, David. I think there's a lot of things that a lot of people could do that are marginal costs that should be where they start. Doing an in-depth analysis of, of your network, right? Figuring out who you already know. Figuring out the people that already know. You know, people tend to associate with people like themselves. So if you're a senior level executive and you're in a B2B space and you've got a bunch of, you know, C-level executive colleagues, friends, former clients, reaching out to them and saying, hey, would you give me the name of five of your friends that I can send the book to on your behalf? I mean, people sometimes get too obsessed with selling the book. It's really about getting the book in the right hands of the right people to get the right outcome. And if you, you know, the, the investment of 200, 500, 1,000 books to risk a little bit to get them in the right hands, assuming it's coming. You know, if I said to you, David, give me, you know, name of five of your friends that uh, could help me do A, B, C, and D, and they got a book from me who they don't know from a mutual friend, that's going to mean something. And those things don't yeah. cost a lot. You know, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, you got a great, if you've got a great relationship with your publisher, you can sort of ask them to chip in some books to help to send out to their sources. You know, I have a saying, if you don't ask, you don't get. It's biblical. Ask and you shall receive. Publishers love to see authors that are busy actively doing something because most authors don't do anything. So um, keep that feedback and the relationship with the publisher really close. And so, do so, 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 David, we have a good relationship. That's what you're telling me, huh? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we had to present your book yesterday to the sales team. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> well, the, the other, the other, the other thought I want I want to put out there, David, which is I don't come from the publishing world, right? Um, is is that the publishing world tends to work in cycles, and they think about right. a book almost like an article of clothing. Oh, that's you know a you know a, a seasonal. That's a spring line, or that's the fall line, or whatever. I think most of us, and there are some exceptions if you're writing a book about COVID or something like that, but most of us need to be looking at the book through an amortization schedule of five to seven years. This book has value. This is evergreen, right? And over five to seven years, it will still be equally valid today as it, you know, in, in a year from now as it is today getting it in the right hand. And I think, you know, sort of book world operates in 90, 120 day, whatever cycles. But could you give an example or two people that have done an effective job of extracting maximum value from a book over not just launch, but a year later, two years later? Oh, absolutely. And that very key word you just said is a great example, launch. We, so we've got a book by Jeff Walker called Launch. And in it, I think everybody should read it. But in it, he helps authors recognize the, the ability to launch themselves brand spanking new to the world three times a year. Their, their book needs to be re-released. Their product needs to be re-released to the world every, every four months because it's new to somebody. There's a new audience. There's new fans, new followers, people that didn't act the first time. So um, he has literally been relaunching that book. And we first published it, I think, in what, 13? Hit number one New York Times bestseller in, in yeah. 2013. Yeah. And, and he relaunches that, that great book, you know, four, four times a year. And every time we, we, we sell hundreds of thousands of books. <laughs> so never yeah. stop. No. Got it. No, great point. Anybody got any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes here left. Anybody got a question for David or I? Howard. There you go. Yeah. Thanks, Howard. Um, well, how do we start? Where do we start? So I appreciate this whole spectrum of the pre pre publishing, post publishing, marketing, and everything. Where do we start in looking at publishers um, and, and ways to publish? I know, uh, David, on your website, you've got a nice chart of the comparison. Um, but but so who do we talk to? Or how do we make that decision? Yeah, great question. So I, I can well, start there, Peter, if you want. Well, let, let me. Let me pre-answer that because I might, and then I'll hand yeah. it to you. So I think the first question, Howard, is is um, make why are you convinced that you need to publish this yet? So again, because I don't come from the publishing world, I think I've told more people than anybody I know, don't publish. Not not don't publish ever, but don't publish now. And I think there's too many authors that publish prematurely that don't have their ducks in a row, don't have the foundation set, don't have the other things done. I think the first question, Howard, is is now the optimal time for me to publish for six months or a year from now? Then it's, okay, who is, is the right fit? So that's where I'll hand that back to you, David. Yeah, so yeah, again, do whatever Peter says. Thank you, Peter. So I think that's good. <laughs> um, but if, if you do have the opportunity um, uh, to get picked up a publisher with distribution, you do want to engage the publisher as early on in the process as possible. Uh, I can't tell you how many books we accept on a proposal perspective, meaning I plan on writing a book on this. Uh, because it does take forever, and I say forever kind of loosely, and to get into bookstores, you know, for us, as quick as we are and as nimble as we are, it still takes us nine to 10 months to show up on the bookstore shelf. 
uh, we don't have to print that book till about four months prior when we send out for professional reviews, send out the sales reps. Uh, we really technically don't have to print that book until 30 days prior to pub date. You know, if we really get pinned to the, to the wall, uh, but you need to engage the publisher as soon as possible because you can do a heck of a lot. One, build your platform or continue to build your platform, finish writing the book, create those uh, strategic marketing alliances all while we're selling it to the bookstores. Um, well, let me ask you the other side of that, David, though. It's, it's how many, because you and I have had conversations where someone came to you, you gave them some advice, you gave them some counsel, they thought they're ready to rock and roll. And as a result of that conversation, um, they're not. They realize they're not. And they come back to you two years later, and now they're in a position to win. Yes, that happens often, too. And it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. Sometimes they'll come back, in a, like you said, in a, in a better position to win. Um, the ideas fleshed out, you know, neater or the right co-author came to the table. I struggled with one of my books back in the day. I kept trying to, to write it and try to launch it on my own. And I just, it just kept struggling. The content wasn't right. The message was, was a little bit clunky. It wasn't until I found the right co-author that really brought it mm -hmm. together that it worked for me. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we had something else in the chat here. Let me see. Somebody asked, uh, my topic is technology, which changes often. Are any publishers interested in annual revisions? I have no idea, David. Any publishers interested? Yes. Um, so the biggest, the bigger, bigger publishers um, tend to source those on their own, meaning like they'll they'll hire writers themselves and publish those books Stop themselves, not have to pay any royalties. Uh, but then it's all about if those if each of one of those editions, if they can earn out and make money. Um, so if you can guarantee an audience to buy X number of copies every revision, that'd be you know that'd be great. If not, or not yet, then I would look at a hybrid or even self-publishing to establish your footprint or establish that audience. And when you get that audience that the broader distribution can handle and afford to be done, uh, then yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, publishers love books that just consistently sell. And even if that ends up being second editions, again, as long as each one pays for themselves or more, you could find a great partner. Excellent, cool. Anybody else? We'll give one more one more round of questions here. If anybody's got anything, Leslie, you put your hand up. Um, have the sales cycles changed with the pandemic? So that's a great question. So um, yes and no. So right now is an exciting time to write books that are relevant today, if you can. It doesn't necessarily have to be related to politics or have to be related to COVID, but if there's something that's just that the world's talking about right now. We literally had a meeting with uh, Barnes & Noble yesterday who's begging us to bring some stuff urgent, big books urgently right now, so the audience needs it. And I read into that, the, the bookstores need it. The bookstores need some economic recovery, and they're going to do that with current relevant books that can be released as quickly as possible. Outside of that, the, the rest of us, if you will, that write just good general books that uh, doesn't necessarily mean there's something timeless about what's going on in the world today, everything is the same. You know, we're still presenting books months in advance. Um, unfortunately, all of us who had books coming out in, you know, March, you know, June, July, you know, we, we kind of lost out on that shelf placement because most of the stores were closed, but they did still sell a lot at the curbside. Uh, but generally, uh, they're asking us to continue following the, the same lead times because they still have the same restrictions on inches and budgets per season but they are right now more than ever looking for books that are current and relevant right now to help stay afloat while they're getting back into their groove. Mm -hmm. if, if yeah, and the, ones, the one thing I've read on that, uh, David, is there were, I think the early side, the first 60, 75 days of pandemic, people were actually reading a lot more, right? Yeah. Home, you know, you know, so it was interesting that, that there was a spike in demand and you know, Netflix wasn't the only winner in how people choose to, to spend their time. Yeah. Uh, which is somewhat encouraging for book nerds like us. So uh, cool. Yeah. All right, we're and we're, we're going to, what's that? Even though, I would say, even though Amazon deprioritized books, book sales shot up. I mean, we were up 13% compared to where we were this time last year. And last year was our best year ever in our history. So people were reaching out to the things that were that we were writing and we we're publishing, you guys are writing uh, to solve their problems, to give them some encouragement, to help them figure out what's next, to how to overcome it, how to relieve stress and the anxiety and the yeah. depression. They're, they're buying them books up like crazy. Right. We, we weren't quick enough to create the campaigns of, you know, buy a book, get a free roll of toilet paper, because that would have been the best right. campaign in <laughs> March or April. But we weren't quick enough to figure that one out. But anyway, I appreciate everybody's time. And thank you all for spending an hour with us. And David, I appreciate your insight as always. Good stuff. And if anybody wants to reach David, you could, you could find him and you could 
find me as well. So uh, thank, thank, thank you all for, for stopping by today. Thank you. It's a privilege, Peter. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank you, guys. Oh, thanks. Thanks, everybody.